Okay, I'd like to talk now about simple pulleys. This is a fun application of Newton's laws. I have here a little cartoon 100 pound weight. I think many of you could bend over and pick this up successfully, but that wouldn't be too easy on your back. In fact, it could injure you. So a lot of us are, are capable of lifting 100 pounds off the floor, but it's not desirable. It would be much easier if you could pull down on something with the force of 100 pounds than to lift up. Just the mechanics of, of our body, it's, it's easier to like pull down on a rope with the force of 100 pounds and use your weight rather than bend over and, and lift up on something with 100 pounds. And that's one thing, or what, one benefit of a pulley system here. Let's suppose that you've got a, a pulley mounted to the ceiling. And now you can see that, uh, well, if, if you wanted to lift this off of the floor at constant speed, get it to rise from the floor at constant speed, or just have it suspended. Let me redraw this ceiling pulley, weight. Okay, now it's a triangle. If you just want this thing to hang there, let me fix that. I see two forces on the weight. There's the 100 pound gravitational force and there's the tension. If this is just hanging there, its acceleration is zero, which means the net force is zero. And that would mean that T minus FG is zero. The tension in the rope only needs to be equal to the weight of the object. So you need to produce 100 pounds of tension in this rope in order to suspend this in midair. Kind of a stupid question, but how hard do you have to pull on the rope in order to produce a tension of 100 pounds? Hopefully it's obvious that you would have to pull with 100 pounds of force. Uh, I could draw a bubble around my hands. I see two things applying forces to my hands. There's the rope, which is pulling on my hands due to friction. You can feel the friction between your hands and the rope. And then I feel, um, I'll just call it an applied force. Strange if you've never thought about it, but when you're pulling on a rope, what is the other force on your hands besides the tension which pulls on your hands via friction? Well, that would be the force of your arm, I suppose, on your hands. You've got the bones connecting your, your well, your arm bones are connected to your hand bones. Sounds like I'm doing the hokey pokey here, but um, forces within your body. Okay, so don't get hung up on that. Whatever the tension is, that's how hard you need to pull on the rope. This, this use of a pulley does not introduce any mechanical advantage. The thing weighs 100 pounds. You still have to pull with a force of 100 pounds to get it to rise at constant speed or to suspend it in midair. However, there is a way of rigging up a pulley system so that you can reduce the force necessary to lift 100 pounds. Here's a more complicated use of a pulley. I will refer to this as the fixed pulley. This is the traveling pulley. Traveling pulley is attached to the weight that you're trying to lift. Again, I'm just using this, this short segment to indicate that, that there's some sort of bracket attaching the, the weight to the outside of the wheel. This little segment does not in any way impede the rotation of the, the pulley wheel. Same thing up here. This, this string is wrapped around and attached to the outside of the, uh, of the pulley wheel up top. It doesn't in any way affect the rotation of the pulley wheel. This is how I'm gonna draw these, these pulley systems. Here's what I like to do when determining the required tension. I like to draw the bubble, not just around the weight that I'm trying to lift, but I will let it intercept the rope because this makes it easier for me to see that there are actually two contact points between the rope and everything inside this bubble. We are pretending that this traveling pulley has no mass and this bracket has no mass and these little pieces of string have no mass. The only relevant mass here would be the mass of this 100 pound weight. So if I apply F equals MA to, uh, to everything inside the bubble, well, first of all, I wanna recognize 
the tension is applied at two places. And I've drawn these tension arrows slightly uh, tilted because they're, they're parallel to the string. But let's just pretend that everything's vertical here. Don't forget about the force of gravity. Just like before, if you are either suspending this in midair or lifting it at constant speed, in either case, it's not accelerating. And if it's not accelerating, the net force must be zero. So I'll say some of the forces on everything inside the bubble has to equal zero. I see two tensions minus gravity must equal zero. In other words, the tension only needs to equal one half. Very cool. So there's your first example of mechanical advantage. If this thing weighs 100 pounds and you want to lift it at constant speed, you only need to produce 50 pounds of tension in the rope. And that means you only have to pull on the rope with 50 pounds. So if you're strong enough to sustain a tension of 50 pounds, then you're strong enough to lift, lift a 100 pound weight with this pulley system. You would say that the mechanical advantage is two to one. You get two pounds of output force for every one pound of input, input force. Now, of course, there's going to be a trade-off because you may be thinking, it seems like cheating or, or getting away with, uh, like you're getting energy for free, you're, getting, you're doing work for free. And that term work, we actually will have a pre precise definition for it later. Maybe you've encountered it in another physical science class. But if, this, um, if you want to lift this, this 100 pound weight by one foot, take a guess how many feet of rope you're going to have to pull through. I mean, if you, if you get a two to one mechanical advantage with the force, perhaps you'll have to pay for that with the two to one ratio for the distances. And that is the way it works out. You can, you can see that here. If, if this thing rises one foot, then this also rose one foot. Doesn't that mean that each of these ropes got shorter by one foot? Two feet total of rope just disappeared over here. Where's that going to appear? That should be right here. And that would mean that you'd have to, you'd have to pull this point through a distance of two feet. So you may only have to lift half as hard, but you'll have to pull the rope twice as far. One half times two is one. In other words, there's no way around the amount of work you have to do. You can apply a smaller force through a greater distance to do the same amount of work. This is a theme that shows up over and over again in mechanics. If you've ever ridden a bike uh, with more than one speed with the gearbox, then you know all about this. If you want to ride a bike up a steep hill, you could put your bike into, into eighth gear and push real hard on those pedals so that your, your feet are moving very, you know, you're turning the pedals very slowly as you, as you go up the hill, but pushing real hard. And, you know, you'd be popping some veins in various places. Or you could put the, the bicycle in first gear and you'd be pedaling through many more rotations but it's a lot easier on your body. So you can apply a small force through a great distance or a great force through a small distance. Either way, same amount of work done. Let's look at another example of this. Here's a very similar setup, but the rope has been passed around the pulleys a second time. Not a great sketch, but here's the, the shiv or sheave, I forget how it's pronounced, the pulley wheel. If you looked at it from the side, you'd see these grooves so that you can wrap the rope around multiple times. So um, imagine that this has been wrapped over once and then it comes around, wraps again, and then goes off down here where somebody can grab it. So one of these ends would be, uh, well, let's take a look from the side here. The rope goes around the top pulley, the fixed pulley, under the traveling pulley, and then it goes around and over the fixed pulley again, under the traveling pulley again, before finally attaching uh, to the outside of the the fixed pulley. Remember, this does not at all affect the rotation of the pulley. It's just got to be, the rope has to be anchored somewhere. Just like before, you can draw a bubble around the 100 pound weight, the traveling pulley, and then a little bit of this, the uh, rope just above the traveling pulley. And that makes it easy to count one, two, three, four contact points. So I could draw 
four arrows, each of them labeled T, or just a single arrow labeled four T. There are four tensions lifting up, gravity lifting down, and once again, if you're lifting this at constant speed or just suspending it in midair, the sum of the forces would need to equal zero. If, if this mass was accelerating, you'd have an MA term over here. That would be a little different, but still easy. Okay, in this case, the tension would only, only need to be one fourth the gravitational force. So let's just suppose that, uh, well, if this was 100 pounds, you would only have to pull on the rope with a force of 25 pounds, which is much easier. Of course, you're going to have to pull that rope through four times the distance in order to lift this, the desired distance. Um, think of it the other way, though. What if, what if you are capable of pulling on this rope with 100 pounds of force? Because the mechanical advantage is four to one, if you put 100 pounds of force in, you'd get out one, two, three, 400 pounds. You could lift something that was 400 pounds if you're capable of pulling with the force of 100 pounds. It's kind of interesting to ask, you know, what are the limitations to this? First, we started with a, a mechanical advantage of one to one, then two to one, four to one. Can you just wrap this around? I mean, what if we had so many grooves here, you could wrap it around 10 times and perhaps get a mechanical advantage of 10 to one. You could lift anything, it seems like. Well, of course, how come you can't stand in an auto shop on an auto shop garage floor and lift, I don't know, a cruise liner, like a giant, one of those giant uh, Royal Caribbean cruise ships while standing on the, uh, the floor of the garage or the auto shop? What's, you know, what's, what's the breaking point, so to speak? I'm fairly certain that the rope would break well before you could lift something that heavy. Wouldn't you just bring the whole building down? Wouldn't the ceiling come crashing down? So you'd have to also look at something like this. If I draw a bubble around here, I can actually count one, two, three, four, five contact points. So for this 100 pound weight, the tension in this rope would be 25 pounds. We already established that. 25 times five, you'd have 125 pounds pulling down on this fixed pulley. And that would mean that, that the force of the, in the chain, the tension in this chain up here connecting fixed pulley to the ceiling would have to be 125 pounds. You can kind of see that if you just step back and take a bird's eye view of this whole problem. What's pulling down on the ceiling? Well, there's the, the 100 pound gravitational force that's ultimately transmitted to the ceiling, but there's also you pulling down with an extra 25 pounds. So you can't just lift anything you want by using more and more turns. Also, eventually you're, you're going to get significant friction building up between your rope and the pulley. So if you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, block and tackle, I think that's an old sailing term for pulley systems. They'll have some diagrams of common block and tackle configurations that are used on ships. And I think you tend to see no more than six turns. If you ever pull up, uh, or if, if you pull up photographs of cranes, industrial cranes that are used to uh, you know, for high, high rise construction, and you look at those pulleys, same thing. So the friction also becomes a limiting factor. And that's a little weird to think about because what is it that, that makes this wheel turn to begin with? As you're lifting something, the pulley wheels have to turn. Well, what's touching the pulley wheels to get them to turn? That would be the rope. And that's friction. There's got to be some sort of static friction between the rope and the pulley wheel. So you need the static friction. And yet, on the other hand, it becomes prohibitive with too many turns. I don't totally understand that, but maybe you have some insight there. I want to look at one or two more examples of simple pulley arrangements. And for this, I will go to YouTube. So let me share the screen. This software that I'm using, Zoom, it's got one major flaw that myself and some other people have, have noticed, which is that you cannot begin and end recording while you're in the screen share mode. Okay, so here's, uh, here's YouTube. I've got this video posted on Canvas. Here's the name of the video. This guy's demonstrating a number of different practical pulley arrangements. I really encourage you to take some time to go through this video and apply Newton's laws to the, uh, to the load here. That's what you would call this, the load. And 
when you implement the method that I just described in the previous examples, you're going to pretend that these traveling pulleys are massless. Don't worry about the mass of these pulleys. And in actuality, they're not very heavy anyway. The same is true for these carbiners and, and the, um, the rope that, that's attaching the, the traveling shivs to the load. Okay, so let's turn this into a free body diagram. I took a screen shot. Let's see, so I have to stop share and then share again so I can switch to a different application, in this case, PowerPoint. Ah, so here's, here's the image. And I chose PowerPoint because I can add arrows and draw circles around things. So here's my, my bubble. We usually go with the blue bubble. And I've purposely positioned the bubble so that it encloses the mass that I'm talking about, but it also uh, intercepts these, these ropes. So I can see the number of contact points. I count one, two, three, four contact points. And I've got a quiver of arrows ready to go here. I could draw an arrow at each contact point to represent the individual tensions. Or of course, you could draw a single vector and just label it four times t's. But there are four tensions lifting up. Let me flip this guy around. Don't forget about gravity pulling down. That's too long. And this is not terribly important, but remember that this vector would have to be equal to the sum of the lengths of all these. So technically this would need to be a little bit longer. Okay, if, since he's just suspending that thing, the net force on everything inside this blue bubble has got to be zero. And let's see here, new slide. Get rid of this junk and insert an equation. So some of the force has to equal zero. Let's make this font larger. So I've got four tensions pulling up and gravity pulling down. That's got to equal zero. And you can solve this and find that uh, the tension would only have to equal one fourth of the weight, much like the previous example. The difference here is the way the pulley is configured. Instead of having a single traveling pulley attached to the load and wrapping twice around that traveling pulley, we actually have two traveling pulleys. And he's probably just done that so it's easier to visualize. Okay, I will pause now and go to a later part of the video where he's got a more complicated arrangement. Actually, before doing that, we need to look briefly at some situations in which the tension is not necessarily the same throughout a rope or a string. So here's a person with one, one arm outstretched and in that arm or in that hand, they're holding a rope, which is supporting the weight of something heavy. And this rope, let's say the rest of the, the rope just hangs down like this and it's coiled on the floor, whatever. I know, it's, it's another Da Vinci here. Someday this is gonna be worth a lot of money. <clears throat> yeah, that drawing is so bad. If, if you hadn't heard the, the context of the discussion here, you'd have no idea what you were looking at. But what I'm getting at is here, even this is a, even the, even if this is a single piece of rope, 10 feet long, the tension here has to be equal to the weight of this guy, right? If you draw a bubble around this, tension has to be lifting up just as hard as gravity is pulling down. So if this weight is 50 pounds, the tension in the rope would have to be 50 pounds. But the tension over here is clearly not 50 pounds. We like to use that word slack or loose. If, if the rope is not under tension, we say that it's slack. So the tension here could be practically zero. That's one rope with two different tensions. We don't always have to assume that the tension is the same throughout. And one way to achieve that, instead of uh, grabbing a rope with your hand, you could grab a rope with another piece of rope. In other words, with a knot. So let's look at something else here. I've pulled up my browser. And of course, 
the menu options for, for Zoom are in the way. Okay, good. I was able to get to the tab I wanted. I just pulled up some images of a so-called Prusik or Prusik knot. It's a way of tying one rope around another so that it can grip the, uh, the rope. Um, well, the, the Prusik knot grips this rope. You can Google that, look at some images. I think climbers often use these. You can use it for a rescue operation. It would be good for, um, if you've got somebody in the harness, you can attach that harness to another rope and haul them out to safety. But this acts a lot like a person's hand grabbing a rope. And you just want to know for the purposes, for, for the purpose of these related problems, that the tension on either side of this Prusik knot does not necessarily need to be equal. The tension here can be different from the tension here. And I will also refer to this as a friction hitch. Friction hitch. Let me stop sharing. Prusik knot. That's going to be equivalent to a friction hitch because it could be some other mechanism for grabbing onto the rope. It doesn't have to be a Prusik knot. And the, uh, the video that we looked at on YouTube has an example like that. Here's what I'm talking about. You should watch the whole video so you can see him discuss it as well. Let me maximize this. Okay, this is a different arrangement than he had previously. Same load. This time there's one traveling pulley attached to the load and then a, oh, just happened here. And then there's a second traveling pulley here. This one's also going to move as he pulls uh, the rope down through several feet. This is a friction hitch. And you'll notice it's not a prusik knot and it's not somebody's hand gripping the rope, but it, it behaves the same. Kind of, for our purposes, they're all equivalent. So I will refer to this as a friction hitch. But you want to recognize that it forces, it forces this point on this rope to move with the friction hitch. So the tension here can be different from the tension here. That's the important point. So I'm going to trace this, uh, this single rope throughout its total length and observe the point at which the tension can change. The rope is anchored to the, the ceiling up here, comes down, it makes a turn around this traveling pulley, but there's no, there's no friction here, no friction hitch, so there's no change in tension. Let's assume that the tension is the same throughout here. It's not until we get to the other side of this friction hitch that the tension changes. This is where there's an abrupt change in tension. So we could call this T1, and then I would have to call the tension over here T2. Now, does T2 ever change? Let's follow this rope. It goes up around, wraps around. That's not a friction hitch. And if you think about this carefully, it's being passed around another pulley wheel. This is not an actual friction hitch. The friction hitch is here. So the tension does not change here. It's just changing directions. So it looks to me like we've got two tensions. T1, I'll call it. And then over on the other side, we've got T2. And in order to solve this problem, you will have to make a judicious choice of bubbles. It's all about the bubbles. If you can draw your bubble around the correct object or, or a combination of objects, it'll become fairly obvious how to solve this problem. So let's do that right now. Um, I will have to switch back and forth between this screenshot and Zoom, but I will start by put it, oop, did it again. I see, I can't manipulate this while I'm in. Screen mode. Okay, I will put a bubble not just around the load, but around the load and the traveling pulley and a couple little pieces of the rope because that makes it easier to see that there are two contact points. There's a tension pulling up here and a tension pulling up here. Now, which tension is it? I labeled this first tension T1. So let me go back to zoom here. So for the load itself, let me do a free body diagram. I had gravity pulling down and I had two of those tensions, T1, T1, T1. And if he's just hanging that thing in midair, 
the net force is zero. So two times T1 minus FG has to equal zero. And that means tension one only needs to be one half of the weight. Does that mean that he's pulling on that other end of the rope with a force of one half of the load? Not necessarily in this case. Let's go back to the screenshot again. Uh, the equation that I just wrote solved for T1 in terms of the weight, but the force that he's applying right here is not T1, it's T2. When we jump to the other side of the friction hitch, this is tension T2. T2 just changes directions. The tension in this rope is T2. That's how hard he has to be pulling on the rope. So we need to figure out what T2 is in terms of T1. And there's probably more than one way to do this. Here's how I do it. Let me get these arrows out of the way. If you make the right choice with your next bubble, then it's easy to answer this question. I'm going to put a bubble around the friction hitch and this traveling pulley, and I'll have it cut through the various ropes. I made sure to cut through the, uh, the ropes that have tension T2 and to cut through the rope that has a tension of T1, because when I write my equation for this bubble, I want T2 and T1 to show up in that equation so that I can relate the two. So I've got three of these tensions, and notice those are all T2. They're all parts of the same section of rope. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I've got one downward arrow here. That would be tension T1. You may be thinking that we're going to have to write a second downward force corresponding to the, uh, the weight, a vector for the weight. But remember, we're pretending that everything here is massless except for the load. The friction hitch has no mass. This little traveling pulley has no mass. And these pieces of rope have no mass. And when you go to write F equals MA, if there's no mass, you set those forces equal to zero. Okay, so for the, I'll just call it friction hitch. Let me go back to zoom. Now I'm doing a free body diagram for the friction hitch. If I recall, we had three tensions T2, so I'll just write three T2, and we only had a single T1 pulling down. Three T2 minus T1 has to equal zero because I said the sum of the forces are zero. This thing has no mass, so MA is zero. And we already know what T1 is in terms of the weight. Let's solve for T2. T2 is one third of T1. Well, T1 is one half of FG, so it's one sixth. I don't think that's obvious from the diagram that you get a mechanical advantage of six to one. If that weight were 60 pounds, the, the dude in the video is only pulling on the rope with 10 pounds of force. Let's go back one more time and see if that is intuitive from the picture. In a way it is, because if you just focus on his hand on the rope versus these three, um, I think we can say that this friction hitch is pulling on this piece of rope three times as hard as he's pulling on the rope because of that configuration, right? You've got his, his applied force is being multiplied by three. So if he's pulling with 20 pounds of force, the output here would be 60 pounds. But if there's 60 pounds of force in this rope, do you see how that rope is being, it's pulling at two points on the load. So what did I say? He's pulling with 20, that gets multiplied by three to make 60 pounds here. And then you've got 60 plus 60, that'd be 120 pounds. So he could lift 120 pounds easily by pulling with 20 pounds over here, six to one mechanical advantage. Now, you don't need to, to get good at just seeing that. You don't have to recognize that from the diagram. I would just stick with Newton's laws. That's why we're applying Newton's laws. Draw the appropriate bubbles, write F equals MA. It's really not that bad. Um, now, of course, if he wants this thing, if he wants to lift this through one inch, just one inch above the ground, he's gonna have to pull the rope through six inches. So you pay for a reduced force with an increased 
distance. You may get away with one sixth of horse, but you'll have to pull through six times the distance. One sixth times six is one. There's no way around the amount of work it takes to lift this thing. So mechanical advantage is not about getting energy free, it's about trading force for distance. There are a couple other videos like this on Canvas. I would take some time, look, look at one or two of those. You can find lots more examples on YouTube. Um, evidently, this, this sort of technique is something that a lot of rescue workers, firemen probably have to learn because these uh, pulley systems actually do get used in, in a rescue situation. So there's a lot of practical uses for them. Bye-bye.